Well, welcome everybody. Um, how delightful it is for me to welcome you all to our brand new webinar series hosted by the Dunning Africa Center for International Business Research at Henley Business School, South Africa. Um, and it's a series where we really want to explore what really matters for African business. Um, so the introductions will come a little later. Um, I'm John Fospetta, the Dean and Director of Henley Business School in Africa. My co-host and leader of this series is Professor Rajneesh Narula OBE. I have to say that because it's something of importance to me. And uh, Rajneesh, you can see him smiling there. So um, thank you so much for coming and listening tonight. I see we've got people from around the world here, from the UK, various places in Africa and elsewhere. Our, um, our guests are scattered around Africa and the UK as well. So it's um, a wonderful introduction. We want to talk about why African business continues to be marginalized in the 21st century and what we can do about it. We all know the situation. African economies are still too dependent on low value added goods, mainly mining and agriculture, beneficiation too low, inter African trade too low again, while manufacturing act activities are really declining in many places. And we're seeing little or no movement really towards the knowledge economy, except in specific areas and zones. And we can talk about that later. And unless we shift this, it's likely that Africa is going to get left further behind as the rest of the world pulls ahead in this fourth industrial revolution. We've even talked about the real thing. And particularly in place in, in agriculture, solar, new energy, mining, critical areas for these economies. Institutions of education like Henley obviously have a role in facilitating the shift, doing something about this, mobilizing, mobilizing to change the momentum away from marginalization. And the school sees itself, Henley Africa and Henley Business School globally, sees itself not just a teacher and educator where we prepare business leaders to the world of work, but more broadly, we understand our role to be that of, of a knowledge creator factor. What does this involve? Well, for example, it means writing relevant case studies that showcase African success and producing white papers on topics relevant to African business, too few of those. We also seek to drive research and engagement on these key issues, as issues we research on, as we hope to do here today through our seminar series. This isn't a series where we're looking for polite consensus. We wanna have challenge and dialogue and debate we want to see every side of this. This is a place where it's, we really want to spend our time well to think well and come out of this, perhaps not with solutions, but with better questions. And those little irritants in our brains that, that, that grind away and make the pearl in the oyster. I aim at this series twofold. We want to tackle some of the difficult or ignored questions that impact African business globally and to broaden the conversation by creating a platform where a range of stakeholders, high level stakeholders, interests in Africa, can engage. So while we've assembled a panel of experts here to provide us a thoughtful analysis of what keeps Brazil African business marginalized or not, if you think differently, we want to ensure that everyone here has a voice. And you've got questions and we've got uh, Q and A's down the bottom. You can put comments in the chat and we've got people who bring that together. We, um, we believe it's through dialogue that we can start to formulate a stronger, more prominent role for Africa. There's lots of speech in Africa and too little voice, and we intend to have a voice. And we want to collectively reclaim our identity and make sort of authentic inroads, assertive inroads into the global market. And in these seminars, I hope that you will speak out through our distinguished guests and to them and make your voice and ideas heard as, as, as how we can achieve this. So it's wonderful to see people who've come from around the world. Um, I'm going to introduce everybody a bit later on after I first introduced um, uh, Professor Rajneesh Rurula. I mustn't forget to thank the people who've organized this, who've marketed, who've arranged all the technology. And with that uh, overlong introduction, please Rajneesh, over to you for the real meat of the matter. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to say in uh, that the, the most popular used expression uh, is uh, unmute yourself, please, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this, uh, this year and last couple of years at least. So welcome, and I'm really happy to that we finally managed to get this off the ground. I've been very excited about this project, about setting up the Dunning Africa Center. It's been a personal passion of mine uh, for a number of years, uh, and I've been pushing forward with this. And I really believe that uh, there's so much that can be done by 
having or instigating Pan-African conversations, and not just Pan-African conversations, also the diaspora. You know, myself in the diaspora, we have Aloysius here, uh, we have a wide variety of expertise. And you know, there's no reason that knowledge should be uh, the private uh, uh, domain of any particular group or individual. I believe intelligence has no nationality. Uh, smart ideas don't need to be labeled in any particular way. We need to share and learn from each other. So this is really, the, for me, the key thing, that there should be more dialogue and there should be a, across Africa between experts from academia, from business, uh, and from policy. And we've tried to, to do this, uh, and on this in this particular event, and we're going to be doing this uh, once a month, every the first Thursday of every month, the same time, so you get used to the idea, we're going to have this type of engagement with a variety of different kinds of stakeholders. And really, it's about a conversation. The Dunning Africa Center is a conversation more than it is a place. We don't have a physical uh, center. This is the 21st century. We are exchanging ideas through the web and through all of these uh, new mechanisms that uh, we have got introduced to by the pandemic. There's something good has come out of the pandemic. Uh, we all know how to use Zoom, and nobody is afraid of it anymore. Now, I think that uh, you know the Dunning Center itself. I should say something. This is a, we 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 just launched this uh, uh, in in this academic year for 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 academics. That means uh, July. Start, uh, our year starts in July and ends in July, and we have uh, we are in the first instance a webinar series. Uh, we are mainly about creating dialogue and by by exchanging knowledge, by moving people from, from different parts of the world to talk to people in different parts of the world, do joint research, of course, at an academic level, but also at the same time uh, to promote knowledge exchange in any way we can manage it. So one of the ways in which we're doing this is that the, uh, we have a Dunning Africa Fellowship Scheme and our, the first recipient of the Dunning Africa Fellowship is Aloysius. Uh, Aloysius Nuram Kahindi, who uh, is with us uh, here, uh, has come in all the way from uh, what is speaking to us from Victoria, nine hours time difference uh, or something like that. Um, and uh, and we, this is, uh, he's, uh, he's originally from Tanzania, I believe, uh, and he's at the University of Victoria in Canada, but the other side, the Pacific coast. Um, and he's looking at informal institutions, the uh, uh, how we can apply sustainable development in Africa. But it's a you know, really it's a pleasure to have you know, finally to be able to start this inaugural fellowship scheme. We are going to be advertising this, by the way, every year, and there'll be a Dunning Africa Fellow, uh, which will go alongside this. And then we're going to try and look into the idea of running short and intensive courses on relative re on relevant uh, topics, not just in South Africa, but uh, across the continent. Uh, I myself grew up in Nigeria, and uh, so obviously there's a, there will be a, a strong Nigerian uh, element uh, to the story, as indeed you will notice from the choice of uh, speakers. So some of the issues really we were looking at is globalization, and global, globalization means supply chains, which have been wonderful in many ways, but uh, in other ways they have, been, they have not been very beneficial to Africa. They're, they, we're still mired in, 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 uh, in low value adding, in agricultural industries, in mining, in, in extraction, but not as John said, in the high tech manufacturing, in the knowledge intensive industries. Uh, and understanding this is, is really, really important. Understanding how we can, we can actualize the opportunities for small businesses and large businesses, not only about the small, small act, it's also about the big firms. We need knowledge transfer that takes place also through foreign direct investment uh, amongst other mechanisms. Anyway, but these are conversations that are going to be taking place here in the Dunning Africa Center over the next uh, few years. And so I'm hoping that you'll all join in to have this discussion. So today's format, uh, we're going to have, uh, we have uh, 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 four distinguished uh, panelists and we're going to have a conversation. And as John said, we're trying to be provocative. We want you to think about things, maybe think about things in ways you haven't thought about them before. Maybe you will get upset, even better, uh, because in fact, uh, the first revolution begins in your mind. Uh, so I think this is really, uh, we want to start, spark something and hopefully this dialogue will lead on to important things. 
So I think we're, how we're going to work the next hour and a half is we will have a conversation, really an armchair conversation with our, our distinguished panelists. Uh, John and I will be prodding questions. We'll be looking at the uh, Q&A feed and then we'll phrase things and then we can, we can hopefully there will be some sparks between and amongst our, our panelists as well as we move uh, forward. Um, so um, perhaps uh, maybe we should start with an introduction of everybody. Uh, shall we introduce, uh, briefly introduce everyone uh, and then we get uh, kicking off. Um, John? Sure, let me, um, let me introduce, um, well, you've done half the work with Aloysius. How do I pronounce this, Aloysius or Aloysius? How do I say it? Well, I don't mind how you want to call it because everywhere you go, <laughs> people <laughs> tend to, tend to uh, pronounce it differently. So I don't, I don't get uh, offended on, in any way people call me. So Aloysius, Alois, Aloysius, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. <laughs> Okay, well, that's wonderful. Well, that's a start, and um, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce you um, a, little bit, a little bit more. So, um, as, as Rajneesh has said, you're the first um, inaugural, the inaugural Dunning Africa Fellow, which is a wonderful thing for us. Um, and, uh, and you're the Canada Research Chair in International Sustainable Development, Equality, and Social Innovation at University of Victoria, Canada, where it must be early in the morning. And you're mm -hmm. studying, as I understand it, why governance under informal institution works and multinational um, enterprises can honor and adjust to those institutions and how they can fail if they don't adjust. And you're looking to find with your research team mechanisms to encourage investment in social solutions to poverty, unemployment, and environmental issues. And um, you're expected, I understand, and, and of course, Raji didn't say the expectations on this, to give at least one seminar to our UK campuses and uh, please spend some time in residence during the academic year. And you can, uh, you can go to the UK where it's very boring and the weather is rainy, or you can come to South Africa and have a lot of fun with us. And so we hope you're gonna do the latter. And uh, the fellowship is uh, targeted towards individuals who have a track record of publications in literary journals, but are not yet established in a sense, but have a PhD and are building their career. So super welcome to have you. And um, I can't wait to get to know you better. Aloysius. Thank you. My Thank pleasure. you. It's a pleasure. Yeah. And Thank Frank, you. Yeah. Um, I'm going to introduce Frank Aswani, um, who is, uh, there he is, with a, he's also got the right um, background there. Thank you, Frank. We know each other very well. Um, Frank, Frank, Frank started as a vet, um, interestingly, and clearly didn't like animals much because he left that. But I'm sure he did. And you're the CEO at African Venture Philanthropy Alliance, which is a network of social investors collaborating to increase the flow of capital um, into social investors across Africa and to ensure that the capital is applied for maximum social input and that, that impact. And that's really interesting. For a Kenyan living in Johannesburg, you've got plenty of case studies and opportunities to look at. Um, you had six years of VP and Director of Strategic Relations at the African Leadership Academy, which is a phenomenal um, sponsored education for young people across Africa. It's legendary and um, it's wonderful to, if anyone hasn't heard about that, please look into it. And you've been working in the private and public sectors and social sectors. You also worked for three years with Absolute Return for Kids as Regional Director of Africa and 14 years with Eli Lilly working in Kenya, India, and Switzerland, and South Africa, where you're sales director for South Africa and regional director for Sub-Saharan Africa. So you worked in the Anglophone and Lucifer Sub-Saharan uh, states. I don't know if you speak Portuguese, but uh, we'll find out, I imagine so. And you're a passionate Pan-African and, and a great teacher. By the way, Frank, you're a great teacher. So great, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Really happy to be here. Pleasure. And over to you, Rajneesh, for the um, other two, if you'd be so kind. Let's start with Eben, uh, Eben uh, Jackson Adekola, um, who uh, also goes by the name Victoria Jackson occasionally. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so Victoria is, uh, has studied in, a, grew up and studied in Nigeria, in Ghana, and the United Kingdom, and uh, uh, has gotten, is, works in the financial services industry. And started off, I think, in the reinsurance business, Munich reinsurance, and various different roles in various different uh, uh, 
uh, reinsurance companies uh, over the years, uh, and uh, mainly, of course, in the United Kingdom. Then moving back to, to Nigeria, where she was uh, most recently, before her current position, was uh, Chief Operating Officer of Liberty Hold Co., which uh, I think is a South African uh, operation, uh, before becoming CEO of, uh, of Marsh Anglophone West Africa uh, a year ago uh, or so, I think, and uh, is uh, kind of bedding down in this new role uh, and kind of, uh, kind of understanding the boundaries of business within uh, and uh, amongst the West African countries, which is a challenge given, uh, and we're going to talk about this, I'm sure, uh, at some level, is the degree of disconnectedness between uh, the West African states, despite 50 years of, uh, of, um, of so-called so economic integration. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. And then last but not least is uh, Mohammed Sani Abdullahi, who is otherwise known as Datijo. I won't explain why. I'll uh, leave that to him uh, if you want to squeeze that out of him later on. Who is was formerly the commissioner for uh, budget and planning uh, yeah, in Kaduna State in Nigeria, as well as having been the, the chief of staff for the governor of uh, Kaduna State. Uh, he is uh, he's a graduate of Amadou Bello University, at my alma mater uh, in Zaria, and. Um, um, also University of Manchester, and uh, currently doing a part-time PhD with us at Henley uh, on the issues and challenges of informal sector and agricultural value chains. Uh, he has a very impressive CV, and I could go on for hours, uh, but I won't because we, I think we should get to the meat of the action. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, shall we open up to uh, kind of listening to our, the views of the panelists and not the the, the uh, chairs like ourselves. Let me start with you, Frank. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm going to do this to each of the panelists. Just get, take a couple of minutes to tell me what you think are the main constraints to Africa not benefiting from globalization. Why? What are the causes? What do you think are the key things that matter uh, for, for holding us back in, in globalization? So first of all, thank you, um, Rajnesh and, uh, and John and my fellow panelists. It's really great to be here. Um, I think this is a really important part of the general conversations we should be having on the continent around uh, what can we take from the past to inform our future initiatives as Africans as we seek to make our continent a better place. Um, and, and this whole conversation around marginalization of Africa, uh, whether you're looking at trade, politics, um, social issues is, is an ongoing um, thing, but I think we're in a good space at the moment where uh, a lot of the challenges that we face in Africa uh, have huge upside in terms of what we could do to, uh, to attract not just investments or other kind of resources to elevate us to a different level. And when I look at just marginalization of Africa, um, we, we, from a trade perspective, for example, I think one of the reasons why we, we've been marginalized for so long is you've got to be able to offer the world something that the world needs, and we just don't produce enough as a continent. Um, our manufacturing base is too, too low, and uh, we are also not doing enough uh, to produce some of the finished products that the rest of the world needs. So I think just from a, an industrial perspective, we could do a lot better in terms of what we produce. And then there are a couple other things that uh, we've got to uh, factor in and I'll talk about them in terms of perceived, uh, you know, things that we have to deal with. There's a general perceived uh, low returns. When I talk to some of my investors in my network, they, they figure out that in some cases, our risk return uh, opportunities in Africa are too low um, compared to what the rest of the world offers. They talk about perceived political and business risk. They talk about our small and fragmented markets. Um, uh, and if you think about it at 54 countries, uh, if you're gonna build up an African business, it, it can be a bit of a challenge. Um, uh, they talk about the lack of infrastructure, uh, especially around transport and energy. Um, and they talk about, um, many of them would not admit it though, the lack of local intelligence uh, on what it takes to be successful on the continent. Uh, so, so these are some of the issues that we, we hear being raised um, 
pretty often. Uh, I'm, I'm sure my panelists will cover a few other things, but um, these are very common things that I hear being talked about all the time. And I think this is actually kind of a natural uh, progression is going to ever. Uh, and your first point were about risk and return. And, uh, you know, she's the financial services. Uh, who better to speak on this? But you want to add more as well, uh, um, Ebon, why don't you uh, give us a shot at, at this as well? Uh, thank you. And um, I really, um, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm, I love the questions that you, the thoughts that you came up with, John. Uh, we spoke, we're talking about marginalization of Africa. When I read the topic, the first thing I thought of was whether Africa has been marginalized or we have actually marginalized ourselves. Um, yes, the, the issue is how do we transition to more knowledge-based um, industries? And to my mind, there are a number of very basic um, items that we need to provide that we're failing to. We talk about risk and it's in, for my industry, we're looking at some, some level of stability. Uh, John, you, you mentioned security, political unrest, but then we're also looking at sim simple things such as uh, stability of legislations, regulations, some level of, um, of assurance of, uh, of, of due process. Um, I, I'd, I'd be looking for key business uh, drivers to, to have some level of stability. Uh, where we're not having interventions regularly uh, or rather irregularly come through and, and throw one's business plans out of the, out of the water. Another basic thing beyond, um, beyond infrastructure, we'd be looking at um, accountability. So where, and I don't have the answer to this, but how do we improve the accountability within our various governments. So we're looking at our judicial systems. We're looking at the regulators and the, how well or poorly we are regulated. We're looking at how our laws are formed and, um, and whether or not there are even contradictions. And I could give examples from just within Nigeria, some things as basic as within a couple of years ago, we had land contradictions within the land, land laws. And we're talking, this is very basic when we look at assets. And, and currently value added tax is being argued about who we should be paying that, that to. I mean, these are very basic, um, these are very, very basic issues that ought not to be a challenge. And, and if uh, you're an investor and looking to, to put your money in, of course the risks seem high. And these are not uh, risks that are within your control and easily mitigated. Um, but, but, but yeah, so I, I think I'll stop here for now. With regards to local capacity, these are things that I think most businesses would be very willing to invest in if we just got the basics right. As uh, as as has already been, been spoke, Frank mentioned, the infrastructure can be can be solved. People will be able to provide and train capacity. But how do we need to sort? We need to sort out the basics first. Thank you, Ebon. I, I think you made some very salient points here, and I, one of the first things that jumped out at me is the issue of stability. And uh, I know this is something that uh, that uh, many of us have given a lot of thought to. You know, it's there's a was a very influential study uh, a number of years ago which showed that the, you know, why the returns on investment, the returns on schooling, the returns on everything in Africa is low. It's not because of the form, absence of formal regulations uh, or the absence of, uh, of human capital. It's the absence of stability of policy, of, uh, or whether it's formal policy, formal policy or it's informal institutions. But the fact that regulations and rules change so often, uh, investors become very shy of uh, even individuals uh, they are afraid of investing because they're rational. The rules keep changing. Why do I make a long-term investment when the rules might change in the short term? So it's been a kind of a, a fundamental issue. And, uh, you know, I'm reading something written by some colleagues who are working in Kenya, looking at the Kenya-Uganda border. And it's, despite the fact that regulations have been set up uh, to encourage uh, trade, 
uh, formally, people still prefer to smuggle things because they don't trust the state uh, to allow the goods to move as described in the law. So it's quite an interesting uh, issue about the issue of st stability. The people, the, the average person has to feel they, they are able to trust the state uh, in a way. Um, let me let me turn this to uh, our policymaker here, uh, because the, you know he can also speak a little bit on infrastructure. Uh, Mohammed Sani was uh, chairman of in Infrastructure Council of Kaduna State, uh, and he has been instrumental in in uh, in, in improving the infrastructure uh, in the state. So he you know and uh, can't find a better expert on the subject. So turning to you. Thank you very much, um, Rajneesh, and congratulations to the Dunning Africa Center uh, for this uh, first inaugural event. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be able to join, and congratulations, Aloysius, for being the first um, fellow. And I think really that um, these conversations will be critical, uh, especially as we're two years on from the um, beginning of the COVID pandemic, which really hit African economies adversely, I think. In some of the reports I've read, um, the pandemic probably resulted in one of the largest recessions across the continent that has been faced uh, in almost 50 years. And so <clears throat> just recovering from that, I think these conversations that we're having today and we'll be having, as Rajneesh has mentioned, on a monthly basis, I think will be critical in how um, the continent itself emerges and probably starts to really reintegrate into the global economy and departs from this uh, current marginalization that has been ongoing. As, as Rajneesh has mentioned, I, for the last seven years at least, have been working uh, in Kaduna State. Some of you might know it. Um, it's a state um, that has about nine to 10 million people, 9.5 million people. Um, and it's located in the north of Nigeria. So right um, now we're facing um, huge challenges regarding security, for example. Um, and these are some of the major issues that affect um, businesses on the continent. Um, as it is currently today, like um, three weeks ago, we were in, uh, across Nigeria, we had a collapse of the national grid, right? And the power um, generation ministries and um, agencies have come out to say this is the result of insecurity, of sabotage. But what it means for businesses is that I mean, a few bankers just left my office now and what they were telling me is that they now have to close at 1 p.m. in the afternoon, all right? Because they can't afford the cost of diesel for the generators. So if banks have to close at 1 p.m., you can imagine what's happening to manufacturing. You can imagine what's happening to industries across the sector. And this is not just in Kaduna State, this is across Nigeria today, right? The power outages are huge. Um, diesel now costs about 600 naira per litre, which is about, um, I believe, uh, almost two to three dollars a litre. And I mean, the, there's huge inflation um, right now. So really the cost of doing business is quite high. Um, so, so this is a major, major issue that we're dealing with. And I'm sure that if Nigeria is going through this across the continent, probably there's more um, countries that are also facing these um, challenges. So I think that the cost of doing business um, is pretty high. Uh, and one thing that I think that we, in 2015, when our government first came in, um, we looked at the World Bank rankings because we were trying to find an objective assessment of how we were doing in terms of businesses and how supportive the government was. And at that time, we were number 24 out of 36 states in Nigeria. So we worked for about two years, worked very hard to change the metrics uh, to address all the um, uh, various components uh, of the doing business matrix. And we emerged uh, in the next survey that was done in 2017, 2018 as number one. So the easiest state to do business in Nigeria. But when we sat back, I think a year later to really look at it, we realized that the um, growth, um, I, I mean, hadn't changed uh, that much. The in economic indicators for business hadn't really changed that much. And we did um, deeper research, and this is what led me actually to uh, Rajneesh and to the Henley Business um, uh, School. We realized that over 80% of our economy was really the informal sector, right? So it didn't matter because the indicators like the World Bank doing business indices really target the formal sector. 
And so you, you lose 80% of really the businesses because these are small businesses that are in the informal sector. They've got low knowledge, they've got low access uh, to skills and to quality. They run by a couple of people. Uh, and really there's nothing you can do if you really focus only on the formal sector, right? And so we've really started to look at, we've been looking over the last three, four years about how do we remove the binding constraints and what makes businesses remain or choose to be informal? Because we think this is key in the way that Africa integrates with the global economy. It's key in the way that global value chains interact with businesses across Africa, right? And so really understanding why do businesses uh, choose the informal sector rather than formal? And we found that there's a huge issue regarding these are rational decisions. These are not because they um, have been excluded in some sort of way. We found that most of the businesses take rational decisions to remain informal because it costs them less uh, than when they become formal. When they become formal, uh, the, the transaction costs and the taxes they face uh, are much higher. And when the government knows that you're there, you face both um, on the table and off the table sort of um, charges. Corruption is an issue. Um, and if you're, you're known, you face uh, much more of that. And the other part of it is, is the issue of, of, of as you've said, um, Rajneesh, and, um, and I, I believe uh, the one or two speakers before me, the issue of infrastructure. Now, not just the power, but other public goods like insecurity, water, health insurance, social protection, all have to be provided by these businesses themselves. Now, these are binding constraints that you face uh, when you set up businesses across Africa, right? And these are some of the issues that um, uh, hamper the ability to not only survive in the manufacturing sector to build value added, uh, high value added goods, but also to transition to the knowledge economy, right? Um, during the COVID pandemic, one of the things that we faced across the continent was while everybody was moving to Zoom and Microsoft Teams because of low bandwidth issues, um, we, the catch up was really very um, slow. And especially for students uh, in remote areas who are expected to go to school online. Now this um, really um, uh, amplifies as you go higher and higher. So I believe that you know uh, these conversations that we're having today, very critical, very important, very topical for us uh, in Kaduna and I'm sure across Nigeria and Africa and um, I believe that, you know, as we come to talk about solutions, we'd be uh, really very interested to listen um, more. Uh, and also, you see, try to, as much as possible, integrate it into, into policy. So I'll stop here and, um, and listen. Now. This, this was very uh, useful. Thank you for that. I think, uh, I mean, a number of things, of course, jump out from, from that, but I'm not going to go into too much of this stuff. But... I think that uh, that understanding, of course, that states have limitations as well. There's only so much that the state can do. Um, and uh, so, yes, policy is important. Stability of policy is important. Stability of institutions is important. Uh, but there's also a limit to uh, uh, the, what, what role the state can take over. And there is a tendency, I think, in many uh, countries uh, to assume that the state has the primary role of providing almost everything. Now, there's, you know, you have to sort of come to, there's a balance between this, between these two. But anyway, let me give Aloysius a, a chance to also express his thoughts on the matter. I'm impressed to hear from the three uh, uh, members in our discussion, what they notice the critical issues that really have uh, a slow down growth in Africa for a number of years. Um, having said about that, um, I'm still very optimistic not to simply say that Africa has been marginalized all the time. I think there have been a variation across countries where some countries have been really doing well, and some have achieved great results, um, maybe in the, in the last few years. And some, in fact, for a number of reasons, they've been really marginalized greatly. I think this can go either with two, two main factors. One is that uh, in the 1960s to say 1970s, where many African countries got independence, 
Um, I think many African countries in sub-Saharan area region um, were struggling to try to define themselves. Where do we want to be uh, in terms of developing our economy? Do we want to pursue agriculture? But what kind of agricultural uh, standard do you want to produce? So moving from a predominant subsistence type of agriculture to a more modern, aggressive and competitive agriculture was a challenge for many sub-Saharan African countries. Some did well, some did okay, but, but the majority didn't do very well. The second thing is to do with the type of education that uh, many sub-Saharan African countries adopted uh, during that time. I say in most cases, the education could be defined as inappropriate many sub-Saharan African countries. It didn't prepare people in those countries to really utilize the indigenous uh, type of skills and knowledge that could generate innovation uh, that, that was unique to African needs and at the same time translate it to international or global need uh, of goods and services from Africa. So those two things that actually um, have, been, uh, have been a really challenge for many sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, but from the 1990s, we are seeing a drastic change uh, from those sectors. We are seeing a number of African countries shifting from uh, dependence on agriculture to mining uh, sector, the extractive sector. But again, toward the late 1990s, the sector again is becoming very unpopular for a number of reasons. Uh, this is due actually to do with the new generation, new age group that has emerged in the continent. This new generation born in uh, let's say 1995 or 2000, they regard themselves as, um, as a free, kind of a free generation, as they call it in South Africa. In other parts of Africa, they call it their tech, tech generation. They are thinking very different. They don't want uh, to engage in agriculture. They don't want to engage in a subsistence type of farming or the extractive sector. They want something new. Uh, that is more action oriented. Um, they, they, they don't know anything about uh, colonialism. They don't want to talk about it. Um, they learn in school, but they don't want to spend time talking about apartheid, racism, colonialism. They say it's boring. We, know, we want action. I was in Rwanda a few years ago. I talked to young people in Uganda. Tanzania, Kenya, they all say, we need action. We don't want to hear this kind of politics and failure of the past. I think these are the uh, exciting moment when I look at the young population in Africa, they call free generation, uh, which is 70%, 70% of the population in sub-Saharan Africa is under, is under 30 years old. That, uh, that would really bring us to more exciting discussion when we talk about uh, what should be done uh, in Africa. Thank you, uh, Aloysius. I think you know, we're we are kind of, everyone's more or less seems to be agreeing with, with each other, which is good. Um, but um, also I think well, let's, let's pick up the, the argument a little bit. I want to see some, some, uh, some blood on the street, so to speak. Frank. Come on there. <laughs> sorry, sorry, come on. I was going to say that, I mean, it's fascinating what Aloysius was saying but there. I mean, you know, we've got the youth want some action. They want to, we have a lot of experienced commentators on objectifying Africa, talking about Africa from such learned people describing the problems and analyzing them so thoroughly, the problems of the past more often or the near past and being very lucid about it. But from none of that comes this stirring drive to make things happen which is very different from a committee or a panel, isn't it? And what if I look at Eben, she's got to sell things. She's got to sell insurance en masse across Africa. That's not gonna be done by, 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 by peer analysis. Of, we need action, we do, we need some, how's that gonna happen? We, we have to serve the youth better, surely, what do you think? So I think we're coming to the question of education really as a key part of infrastructure. 
Um, and you know, one of the one of the kind of shocking things for me, uh, for me, I, I I was born and brought up in Nigeria, and I went to primary school, second school, university in Nigeria. And uh, now, uh, when I visit the universities in Nigeria, I have to say I'm very disappointed with the the quality of education. It's become there are so many more universities, but there's been no increase in the quality of the human capital coming out of this. In fact, if the quality has gone down, I know all of you, uh, uh, at least I know we can speak, I can speak on the case of Nigeria. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know about whether Frank wants to say something about that uh, in uh, elsewhere in, in, in Africa or uh, others can say something. But I think it's one of the, the challenges really for the youth is that uh, and this is, uh, you have an education, but you can't use it anywhere. You know, there's 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 other side of the coin. You might have studied uh, how to you know, design computers and and repair generators or whatever, but uh, there's no there are no actual jobs there for you. So there's a miss what you call structural unemployment. You have creation of people of the particular skills, and you have the opportunities available which you do not fit either because the quality of what uh, education you had is not good enough, or simply because the jobs don't exist. So it's kind of a chicken and egg story. Where do we start? uh with with this type of issue let me throw this to frank uh first because he likes difficult questions is my feeling <laughs> uh, uh I'm, I'm glad you did that and, and Rajnesh, at some point i'd love to hear your pigeon accent um, to see whether you see <laughs> um so you know this whole issue of of human capital and and the quality of human capital we produce is super critical to the direction that africa will take um our average age in Africa is 19. If you look at globally, the average age in Europe is about 44, uh, US is about 41, uh, Japan is about 51. Uh, so what I'm saying, we're sitting on the world's future talent. And with where the world is today, uh, we need to be thinking about, can we become a top supplier of human capital in the next 20 to 50 years? And for that particular uh, opportunity, we've, we've got to be thinking differently about how I think we educate our, our young people. Uh, education should not be seen as an end in itself, it's as a means to an end. And, and even how we measure the success of education, uh, right now, if you think about it, we measure how many matrics have high school has produced or how many people have graduated from university. We never ask ourselves the question of the so what of education. Is the purpose for us to produce de uh, degree holders or to produce people who are going to be transformative in economies? How do our measurements and metrics go beyond the graduation ceremony to actually ask ourselves, are we producing the caliber of people that the world wants to consume? We're, we're producing a product. And, and the challenge we have today is that we're producing, we're, we're, we're preparing kids for jobs that don't exist. We're preparing them to solve problems that haven't fully been comprehended and to use technology that hasn't been invented. Yet the education system of today is designed around memorizing and regurgitating. We're not teaching kids how to think. And I think the one critical thing that we should be asking ourselves about kids is, are we teaching children how to be good problem solvers? There are certain competences that our kids should be coming out with that are transferable across multiple sectors. If you can solve problems in this world, you can do anything. And you'll always have, you'll be a sought after talent in, in this world. So, so one of the challenges we've got to ask ourselves is if we work backwards from where we, where we are and where we need to be, how is our education uh, system in Africa fit for purpose? Okay, at the moment, we are producing tons of job seekers, tons of them. We need to be creating a million jobs a month between now and 2030 to absorb our young people, a million jobs a month on the continent. Okay, do you know how many we're doing instead of doing 12 million a year? We're doing 3 million jobs a year. Okay, pre COVID, 3 million jobs a year. We have a 9 million job deficit. Okay, yeah. It, it, it is imperative today, I think, whether they end up doing it or not, that every kid in Africa is taught entrepreneurship. I think it's imperative. Okay, because the problems we have on this continent are phenomenal entrepreneurial opportunities. The glass is half full, not half empty. 
And we need to get that psyche mindset in our kids. I worked at the African Leadership Academy. I've seen what an investment in entrepreneurial thinking in young people can result in. You know, by the time we were getting our alumni uh, group to about 2,000 students, of which the oldest was about 30, okay, 77% of the kids from that alumni community were running enterprise across Africa. Fundamentally, because they'd been given the, the grass, the, found, the, the foundation of entrepreneurial thinking. We, we, we can't be offering the same education that our fathers got when economic opportunities that my kids will have are less than what my father had. We, we have to take responsibility as a continent for those of us offering education to ask ourselves, is this economic genocide for our children? It's like going to see a doctor who gives you a wrong pill, knowing that you'll get well. I'll stop there. This is, uh, this is very provocative and very interesting. Um, and I agree with you. I, I would have a quick anecdote when I, my, after I, I did my MBA, um, I used to be an engineer and then I, be, I studied an MBA and I went into work in IBM and I went into the office and the, the head of personnel, there was no such thing as HR in those days. He asked me, what, what can you do? So I said, I have an MBA. He said, no, I didn't ask you what your degree was. I asked, what can you do? Uh, he said, these are two different things completely. Uh, and I had to admit that I, there was nothing I knew I could do. Um, I still had to acquire the actual skills. I have I've had some generic skills, but I needed very specific skills. But he very much embarrassed me, but it made me think about it for quite a while. What can you actually do? Um, and uh, it's a question that I think many people have to ask themselves. Now, you know, this kind of, I'm going to connect this to the issue of accountability, which Ebun brought up earlier on. Um, and, uh, you know, and there's also something going on in the, in the chat area about the fact that, uh, that there is a disconnect between what politicians are saying and doing and what the, what the people, whether we want to call the people to be the young, the youth of, or, of today or the, uh, uh, but it's, so there's a kind of disconnect between leadership um, and, uh, and uh, what, is, what is required as it were. But uh, this, connect, this comes to uh, two levels. One is accountability uh, from, the, from the policy point of view, which I will save for, uh, for Mohammed. But from, from your point of view, accountability as a business person, your, your objective is to hire people, to get the right people in the right place, generate a return on your investment. So how do you deal with issue accountability? What do you want to see at A, uh, from the point of view of uh, the youth, and B, what do you want to see from the point of view of governments? Yeah, so, first of all, I, I think this issue of education being a challenge is, um, is, is, is one of our smaller challenges. It is a problem, but I don't think it's our major one. The, um, it is true that the quality of education has dropped over the decades and um, continues to drop. But you have, I, think the, I think you asked, what is the state's primary role? And we need to define, define that carefully. If the state... Uh, the states that we are looking at now provide basic numeracy and literacy skills to the populace. They would go a long way. Business would then pick up uh, the, the rest of the gap, so to speak. Um, we, we are in a, we're in Nigeria, maybe the challenge, maybe this is cultural, but um, one of the, the younger people, the young people have a saying that I love, which is they, they say, we move. <laughs> Regardless of whatever the challenge is, the, the, the response typically is we move and they find a solution around it. We, we do have a significant number of, of entrepreneurs because unemployment is so high and remains so high, no hope of going forward. Uh, so first of all, to say, I think that of all of the challenges that we've listed, education is probably beyond us providing literacy and numeracy skills. I think that we, education falls very low on the list of problems that the, the government needs to face. I think they need to, first of all, define quite clearly what their role is. Um, from a business point of view, uh, we build in, uh, I have built in about 50 hours of training that is necessary for all staff that come in, regardless of, of what level they, of education they come, come with. And this is because we, we recognize, as you say, that most people join institutions not able to do anything. And, and I don't think this is a challenge for most businesses. If you can give the if you can provide a business with the rest of the, the fundamentals that they need to succeed, 
building capacity is in, in their in their in their staff is is a no brainer, and 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 the, the the topic of you know considering the opportunity that exists because of the, the Africa's huge labor workforce, this has been the story all my life, and I'm fifty. Um, so I, I think we need to think slightly differently. Uh, it's, uh, this is my view. Yeah, good. Thank you. This is a very interesting. Uh... Uh, disagreement to hear. Uh, John, you want uh, the tijo? What do you what uh, What do you think by when you say we need to think and act differently, Evan? What do you really mean? I mean, let's get down to the nitty gritty here, not pulling any punches. Come on, okay. you can do this. Okay, <laughs> right. So, um, question: Education for all. Can we afford it? Probably not. But what can we do? We can certainly make everybody literate. And we, can put, we can certainly allow, give everyone a basic amount of numeracy. The concept of, of this, this concept of being able to provide tertiary level education for the teams of billions of, 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 of people, of children that we have, is simply not practical. And this is why we have, I think, such watered, up, watered down quality of education. And so again, I ask, what is the state, have, have our states actually stopped to think what, sh, what is the priority, what should be our priority, and what can we move, leave to the rest of the, of the society? Rather than trying to, to send 50, billion, 50 million Nigerian teenagers to, to tertiary uh, education, we should just provide some power and they will school themselves on the internet. In fact, we'd rather than worry about internet capacity, let's first of all provide power so they can log on, so they can actually charge their, their laptops. This is very, I, I sound, it's very sound in my opinion. John, um, Frank, I think- Frank uh, proved it, didn't he? Frank proved it, he did it. You see that, that's what he did, eh, Frank? I mean, this is what's so interesting because it's, are we just surrendering to some, lofty ideal of western or something higher education we think is going to make it work or is there a different architecture that's going to lift us up we have to think about you know which I mean, is what you talk about a different form of education john i, I one of the things that I, that that worries me however this conversation is that if we become a continent or even a country of entrepreneurs is that all we need do we need uh, you know uh, 400 million entrepreneurs across africa we need more than just entrepreneurs you you uh, you know you can have you have lots of salespeople, but someone has been making the stuff that you sell, and that requires other things beyond on skills in entrepreneurship and basic. Uh, uh, but that that's a, that's also something to be done. I think, and you know, feel free to contradict me. Uh, we've got entrepreneurship, but we've also got uh, people who can actually do things. Uh, you know, you, uh, we need to have. Uh, capital and old-fashioned knowledge capital. We have to have knowledge inflows, ideas, technology. I mean, uh, Aloysius mentioned innovation, but innovation in the capacity to innovate, to absorb ideas from outside, that requires specialized skills. Uh, you know, you, one cannot teach, uh, one cannot learn how to be a neurosurgeon on, on YouTube yet. And I don't think I necessarily want to go to a doctor who has got... Uh, his uh, diploma from uh, YouTube. Um, so there are, there's a boundary here. We do need skills of other kind. I, I'm going to throw this out there. Maybe someone wants to uh, exp ex throw in a jump into this uh, discussion. Uh, Dineo has a question. Um, um, and he's, he's asking about um, uh, um, trying to address the issue of entrepreneurship uh, and creating a space for entrepreneurship entrepreneurship um maybe we want to uh so yes to what extent do we want to wipe out tertiary education and and replace that with uh, with self-service uh, yeah that is your go on yeah no thanks um Rajnish. I, I think the conversation is, is quite interesting because i think what the panelists are agreeing on is a paradigm shift that's needed in education and what we actually value. 
And I think for me, um, that brings um, a relationship between the way that we've been educated, at least for most of Nigeria and I think parts of Africa, uh, in terms of the origins and cultural uh, issues and then risks as well. I think the origins of education, at least for us in Nigeria, or, or, or I shouldn't say the origins of education, I should say the origin of Western education was from the colonial uh, times. I know that's a bad word um, to talk about, but I think that it's important to understand that what we were being told for was to run mostly governments, right? It wasn't for entrepreneurship, right? And I think that has stuck with generations of Nigerians about how you go to university, essentially to become a worker, of, a government worker, right? And so over the past two decades, I think that paradigm has started shifting in the sense that entrepreneurship has been given more value, but we're still stuck with millions, literally millions of young people trying to go through the same ladder of primary school, secondary school, university, and then getting a government job, right? And it's frowned upon when you depart from that um, structure, right? And entrepreneurship is actually uh, in many places still a bad word, right? If you bring someone home and you say, uh, mom, this is the person I want to marry, and you they ask, what does he do? He says, as a businessman, it's been looked at as, he's been looked down upon, right? It's not, uh, mm -hmm. they'd much rather, oh, he's a clerk at a government office, or he's a, he's a director, or he's uh, something like that. So there's a cultural spin to it as well, right? Now, what we've tried to do in Kaduna was we, we started up a, a Kaduna Startup Entrepreneurship Program, which trains about, what, thousands of young people every year and then gives them loans, right? And we've seen a huge shift in the ability of these small businesses to set up uh, and employ, uh, we have basic accounting skills and, and all of that, right? But to do it on scale, and I think this is one of the biggest problems that we face across the continent, is the ability to take small ideas that work and then do them to scale. Because the continent is so large and so diverse, it's very difficult to change the dial on something that's really become cultural, that's really become part of uh, the infrastructure of the, of the continent. And another part of it is how do we then de-risk um, businesses, because if you try to go off on the entrepreneurship path, the challenges are huge, right? How do you ensure that for capital that you put in, uh, there's some level of de-risking that can happen either through financial institutions or by government itself and all of that. And lastly, government itself across Africa, and this comes to the regulatory issues as well, is still not really built to support businesses. The way that um, policymakers across the continent think is that every single piece of infrastructure needs to be built by government, right? Every single business needs to be backed by government. So I think that getting that paradigm shift in government policymakers as well to understand that we need to be able to provide the, 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 the enabling environment and then get out of the way, I think it's still an issue. And it's one thing that still needs to be brought to the fore and dealt with on this perspective. Thank you. This was very uh, interesting. Can I, um, can I can I can I probe Mohammed on that for the, for a moment? Is that okay, Rajesh? Yes, do so, please. Yeah. So it's interesting you say that 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 policymakers want government to be X Y. Why is that? Is it because people have bought into an idea that the government must control anything, everything? Is it a communitarian instinct from some? different African culture appealing to it? Is it a lack of confidence in people's ability to do that? Or is it a self-enrichment device? Which of these multiple things is it? And how can we actually break that? I think it's actually one and all of it. I think all the points that you've made really factor into the decisions. So uh, I think that when you find governments that have really let go, for example, there was a privatization exercise uh, about two decades ago in Nigeria that sold off a lot of the public enterprises, right? Now, if you take power, for example, it's fully privatized in Nigeria. However, the issues that have come out of it with private sector players who were actually part of the government that then sold it to themselves have now brought about issues around private ownership, right? And they've raised significant concerns about 
the ability of the private sector itself uh, to manage these utilities, right? So in that sense, you're talking about an inefficiency that was brought about by a corrupt, um, I think, process that really birthed some of these institutions, right? So it's a mix of both that have really then reduced the public's confidence um, in the ability of the private sector to handle something as important as the energy sector, right? So I, I wouldn't say that it's one of it. I would say it's a mix of it. And I think that that then requires a policy that takes into consideration a lot of these lapses that you've identified, and then you mixes them in a way that really uh, speaks to the diversity of the, of the issue. So I don't think there's really a one silver bullet that you would shoot to solve all these issues. I, I think that. I think I think Eben, she's she's shaking her. She doesn't have. A, yeah, I know. I, think, thing, so I could see written across her face. She had a contradiction to this. What were you thinking? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think the, the example. I, I don't disagree with the point, but I think the example is a very poor one. I mean, can you really call our power sector privatized? To what ex <laughs> to what extent? Uh, let's. <laughs> I think I think perhaps you want to. I want to take a different example um, because. The government actually controls and, and certain smaller factors still control very much the power sector from the pricing, the lack of competition, the limitations in distribution. You could go on and on. So this isn't, a, isn't yet a privatized sector. Well, maybe I'd say distribution. The distribution sector is privatized because now you've got capital power that's been generated, but it's unable to be transmitted because the infrastructure on that has been, there's been no investment on that infrastructure, right? So and the and entire power sector has not been but a huge part of it, I think, is in okay. private sector. I, I think that uh, that this is actually a topic of the PhD of somebody I know who's. The, uh, um, but so I, the conversation goes then to the kind of classic principal agent problem. But we shan't go into that. The so solving Nigeria's electricity crisis is not going to happen on today's webinar. Uh, but I think we may come back to this. I'll, we'll get uh, Nasiru to come on board for one of these discussions. But uh, we want to, we are, you know, we are, I'm also conscious of the time, because this is a type of discussion that can go on for hours on end. Um, and I think, John, perhaps we can uh, filter a little bit. There's, some, there's quite a bit of activity on the chat function. And it's, yes, I've um, discovered, yeah. What about that one from Frank there, that last point? It's yes, very Frank. Pertinent. Frank, yeah, where Frank you, asked, um, you want to summarize what you responded to? Yeah, so, so I was responding to the question, uh, the comment around, um, you know, we can't build a content of entrepreneurs. And, and that, I think for me, it's, um, uh, I, I, I work in the impact investing space, which I'm trying to um, support the mobilization of capital that seeks both financial returns and social returns. Because increasingly, I think if you look around the world, there is a huge convergence between profit and purpose. Uh, more and more companies are asking themselves, are we just about making money or are we also making sure that, uh, you know, we're doing good for the world and for our community? So there's this whole ESG movement that you're seeing emerging. And, and, and what it's giving to is giving to a huge emergence of, um, of Africa's problem suddenly looking as attractive opportunities. We're seeing uh, an incremental number of, of capital that is seeking um, not just financial return, but profit and purpose in the process that's looking at Africa and saying, suddenly the glass is, is half full, not half empty. And, and for the way we'll benefit and make sure we drive that momentum in Africa is to make sure that we've got enough Africans who are uh, good problem solvers on the continent to help to be able to leverage this capital that is coming in. You know, if you look at just the, the private equity space uh, and the reality, when I'm gonna talk about private equity, the reality is that our governments do not have the kind of money we require to solve our problems. If you look at our SDG financing gap, uh, we need between half a billion to $1.2 trillion annually to solve our SDG financing gap. Aid to Africa is $50 billion and declining. Uh, you know, Trump cut aid to Africa. The UK government has done the same. Our government's tax collection in Africa is about $600 billion. And that's under huge pressure because of our debt to the Chinese and COVID impact. So we've got to be thinking, how do we engage the private sector uh, into being a bit more um, um, uh, you know, participatory in, in not just contributing to our economies, but also solving social issues. And increasingly, I think the paradigm is shifting. I think, uh, Rajnesh, your first comment was, uh, which I took a note of, was the first revolution begins in your mind. And, and we, we need to be thinking about 
what is the paradigm shift you need to be getting in if you're going to advance Africa? Uh, the private sector needs to look at social investments and think uh, th those sectors just are not about just sucking up money. Uh, we can also make money. You look, take an example of the solar uh, lamp business in, in East Africa, where traditionally people used to give us solar lamps to communities. Today, there are pay as you go models that are driven on a, on a for profit basis uh, that are delivering both um, solar lamps to rural communities, but also making money. And, and this is looking at everything. So if you look at upside, um, there's a lot of ap application of modern innovative finance around catalytic investments. Um, there is a really interesting project in, in India where the Rockefeller Foundation put $40 million and crowded in a billion dollars to build 10,000 mini grids, supplying electricity to 22 million people. So we, we should not think of solving our problems in the traditional sense. We don't need to go build big hydro hydroelectric plants. What is a different way we can approach our problem solving on this continent to move our continent forward? And I think this is the time for us to think differently. But that we need to be creative in our problem solving ap approach. Unfortunately, painfully aware of time, uh, and we have, in fact, uh, we are going. To, we have you know, a slot of time here. So, what I, I want to, you know, Frank, you opened a can of worms. Each of you has actually opened a can of worms, and now we are swimming in worms. Uh, and uh, you know, someone has to use these worms to catch fish. Uh, now, let us find a way to, because I, what I can clearly see, and this is the nice thing about the Dunning webinar series, is we're going to do this once a month. And I'm really keen on actually taking some of these strands of conversation. I mean, the accountability thing, we haven't got there really. We haven't talked about the issue of innovation, which uh, Aloysius brought up. We haven't discussed the issue of, of really of, of dealing with the fragmented markets, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, how do we deal with these, these issues? The balance between governments and multinational governments and foreign investment, which is you know, the, the kind of someone you mentioned, Frank, the Chinese debt, you know, which was considered to be a kind of magic bullet to half of Africa's problems, bring in all of this foreign investment, state owned enterprises coming in to provide uh, uh, jumpstart the African economy, which hasn't really led to where the, there'll be no jumpstarting going on. So really, there is a couple of failed models that are worth uh, kind of engaging a conversation into. Now, what I want to do in the in the somewhat limited time we have, and I don't want to keep people later than they should because people have to eat. Dinner is an actual concept I've heard. Um, now, we we what I would like to actually is, is is a we're setting up an agenda for the next few webinar series, and clearly one of the you know many of you are going to be back for, to continue these these dialogues you brought up climate change frank which also i thought was an, it was a very uh, brave issue to bring up and mohammed is uh, i forgot to mention was part of the team that designed the sdgs at the united nation uh when in his previous uh, life before he became a, a, a political uh, appointee in, in nigeria uh, so i want to save some of these things for later on but let us kind of try and wind down today by saying, okay, how do we move forward? Let practically speaking, I'm going to give each of you a couple of minutes to, to say, speak on how you think we can move things forward. What are the next steps? Let's, uh, get, let's maybe start in reverse order. Um, and I'm now trying to remember what the reverse order means. Let's start with Aloysius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> There's no doubt that uh, uh, the level of uh, institutional strength in Africa is not to par, let's say, to a standard, let's say, of developed countries. Institutions remain weak. In the midst of that kind of situation, we need to pursue individuals uh, or business groups who have the know-how to really contribute to changes um, across African countries. That one. The second thing I, I look at the potential uh, for Africa going forward is to really pursue the cross partnership uh, relationship, either between the public and the private, or to increase more cross country type of uh, trade relations. And if I go with the uh, are the individuals. I believe they are individuals who are capable uh, to really contribute to the economic growth across African countries. 
the individuals because they are entrepreneurs, they are successful, they are all over and uh, across Africa, there are business groups within Africa, but also there are business groups who are very interested in Africa. And they live outside. We have, for example, a business group from Lebanon, and they're very interested in Africa, particularly across the West African uh, countries. In East Africa, we have a large business group, the Asian East Africans. And now there's a large business group from China uh, looking for investment in Africa. They are very, very influential into the pri uh, private sector. Um, uh, partnership, uh, the second point I wanted to emphasize again, is, is very critical. Uh, governments, as we have all said, can't really address all critical issues facing African countries. We need the private sector. We need to absorb the know-how they have and how that can help uh, to enhance the capability of the public sector. In all, in all sectors, could be from education, health, uh, infrastructure, and so forth. Thank you, uh, Aloysius. Um, Mohamed. Well, thank you very much, Jared. I'll, I'll make you quick about five things. Um, I think, first of all, we need to be able to address the binding constraints that um, we've all raised today from infrastructure uh, to issues around um, uh, corruption. Uh, I think that we need to be able to look uh, very closely about how to transition the informal sector or at least get it um, uh, counted and recognized and then we uh, structure our policies in a way that uh, can really address the issues around the sector. I think that for where we have good interventions um, happening, I think we need to be able to address it in scale. Uh, we need to be able to uh, look at the diversity and try to see how as much as possible to uh, move uh, things along uh, all together. I think that uh, the last two things, knowledge sharing and regulation uh, remain critical. I think knowledge sharing uh, both within the continent and across you not hear me at all? You were you were fading out at the end. I hear you now. Well, I think at the end I said I said regulation and, and knowledge sharing. Okay. Well, excellent. Thank you. Um, and uh, yes, I mean, you know the cap my capacity to to remember the order is is, is interesting. Uh, yeah, everyone. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Um, so, Alosha spoke to institutions remaining weak and the need for the private sector to get involved in, you know, across all things. And, and like that, Ijo, I agree with you with regards to dealing with infrastructure and corruption and transforming the informal sector. sector. So the question is how? My, I think that we need, uh, in many states, we need to look at, uh, we need reviews uh, from a much higher level. We're talking about constitutional reviews in certain states, just a review of the judiciary. How um, how are our lawmakers, what criteria do we use to determine who is eligible to be a lawmaker? What criteria do we use to determine uh, what, who can be in these regulatory bodies that will determine the changes we make to policy, the changes we make, we make to structures, who is involved in what sectors? We, we, I use Nigeria as an, ex, as an example. And that uh, Tijo, you're, you're in government, so you can, you can question. I, I, I'm curious to know if you disagree. But I think that we are actually running a, a system where a few capable, and very willing uh, participants and players within the government sector, within legislature, within regulator, regulatory body, are marginalized by uh, the swords of the mediocre and cynical uh, people who come through and have no choice but being to be mediocre since they've come through this poor educational system and since they are all marginalized. Uh, so we, we need to move to a meritocracy and we're not doing that without uh, reviews, very significant reviews at the state level. Uh, for me, if we can deal with constitutional review, 
so we know who can enter into our legislature, and if we're looking at a review of our judicial systems so that we can actually, to your point, uh, to the point that we, I raised earlier, Rajesh, start to deal with accountability, then we would, we would make a significant headway. So those would be my two points. Can I just interject here? It's accountability and age. I had this, I think I've seen this on the chat, people asking, saying, if the youth of today, the youth are, in the, are the important uh, factor, why are the politicians so old? Um, now, you know, should we have an age limit to how old you should be as a politician? You have to retire at 55 or something like this. Um, just throwing this out as an idea. Um, Mohammed probably will, will will want to throw have an opinion on that. Constitutional okay. review, or that's would address that. Uh, okay, let's leave it there, <laughs> Frank. Yeah. So, so, so first of all, um, Daniel Center, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. This these conversations we could have over a meal for days on end and still not finish. Uh, so to my fellow panelists, you know, this is thank you for this as well. I'm I'm going to take a slightly different spin on my closing remarks and look at um, all of this comes down to can we also mobilize the right type of capital to be able to fuel all these things that we're talking about, and what does it take for us to be able to um, to do this effectively? If you look across the world, um, especially in emerging markets, a lot of organic, um, countries are looking at especially growing the the SME space. I mean, our biggest risk in Africa, I think, is youth unemployment. We cannot continue to have a population of young people who are unemployed. Uh, the unemployment rates we have right now are shocking, and we are facing a revolution in future if we can't fix it. So we've got to be thinking about how do we drive investments into, into the SME sector and how do we grow that? And we're not the first people to be solving these problems. The Indians, the Chinese have been solving this problem. We also should not just be looking for solutions in Africa. Let's look at the Indians who have entrepreneurship programs that are running in 50, 60,000 schools. We can't get them going in two, three schools in this, in this continent. Um, so one of the part of my responsibility is to see what can we learn from the rest of the continent. But also the, uh, in how thinking about how we mobilize capital, we need to be thinking how we mobilize more local capital. Any money that comes from outside for investment is coming with forex risks, forex premiums. Um, it costs us more to, to get foreign capital. How do we... Uh, be creative in mobilizing local capital? How do we get creative in using? And uh, I think Mohammed mentioned about the risking um, African investments. Th there's a whole emerging world of blended finance where we're merging grants and, and private capital to, 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 um, to make uh, investments a lot more attractive. We, we need to be look, seeking African solutions to our problem. And there's a whole innovation space right now where there's people, very clever people getting very creative with how we package capital for, for, for to make it attractive to into investments. So uh, I, I think huge upside on the continent. Uh, I, I personally believe um, Africa is a Wembley of investment opportunities going forward. Um, and we need to be collaborative and be creative uh, in how we, we not only learn uh, through this process, but also scale some of the solutions that have worked in some places. Thank you. This is very, very nice. Yeah, you, you brought it a full circle because we did in fact one of the things I man mentioned in opening remarks was that, you know, the intelligence has no nationality. Good ideas, you know, this not invented here sy syndrome is something we really need to avoid, that we need to have Africa-specific solutions to, and we can, in fact, learn. And that's the idea. And, uh, you know, even with you know, across Africa and, you know, the diaspora, you know, we have, of course, we have, we have to engage more broadly and be open-minded about our solutions. Uh, the challenges are not small, and th that is very clear. But it's not. I think that dialogue. This is dialogue. Is I was naive when I when I when I first proposed this idea to John about this particular uh, uh, question. I realized it's several questions at, at the same place. John is probably is wiser than me. He, he nodded his head and said, "Go ahead if you want to." I think he, he realized I'm, I was biting off more than uh, we, I could necessarily chew in an hour and a half. But I really think that uh, this has been uh, fascinating. I have, I think I'm going to spend the night uh, staring at the ceiling, wondering uh, what the answers are to some of these questions. And I suspect uh, those of you in our audience will, have also, will also leave inspired, upset, angry, uh, concerned, um, and so on uh, I, uh, in, uh, over the next day or two. So I think uh, 
you know, it, this is a good place for me to hand back to John. So we're kind of slowly winding down today. Just to mention, uh, as, I, as I hand back to John, is this is an ongoing series. Uh, and we are going to be here back on uh, uh, in, uh, the first Thursday of June. Uh, and we have uh, Andrew Mould from the UN Commission for Africa, who's based in Rwanda. And we have Francis Mangeni, uh, who are writing an excellent book on, on it called A Skeptic's Guide to the, uh, the African Free Trade uh, Agreement. It's true impact on the African economy. That's our next uh, webinar. I'm really happy that we started this conversation. I want to continue this conversation with you individually amongst yourselves and so forth. Bring bring it on, you know, and I want you to propose uh, uh, future uh, webinars and, and we shall continue to do this and hopefully we will end up somewhere net positive uh, growth uh, intellectually uh, and socially. Uh, over to you, John. Thank you very much, Rajneesh. I mean, um, I'm always fascinated when I spend time with you because you were brought up in Nigeria. You were, you, you were, you were, you know, I'm going to flatter him, but it's not flattery, it's true. You are a great researcher and also a provocateur in your thoughts. So when you came up with this Dunning Africa Center, um, I was very, very delighted and curious too, because I think you were right. It was a big subject, you know, um, you know the marginalization of Africa, but the, the rest of it was, mobilizing to mainstream. So there is an issue here where you've heard so many different perspectives, where there is a sense that it's not just rational argument or problem solution, there's a mobilization required. And it's from interesting research from Deloitte a few years ago, where they looked at companies, multinational companies implanted in Africa, and they looked at um, the, the multinational employees outside Africa, their opinion on the prospects from Africa were far, were far more pessimistic than the multinational employees of every nation who were actually working within Africa because they could see the opportunities. There's this dour and dire perspective that is imposed, projected on Africa from the outside. We have to fight off, you know, um, we really do. We have to mobilize because there really are opportunities here. And you can see it in what uh, Evan and Mohammed and Aloysius and Frank has said. We've just scratched the surface. So, I do hope that we can make this dialogue that you've triggered into something that will be vivid and alive. And from there, we can start off some initiatives and pull people in to really talk about these important issues that, that true, truly matter. So thank you very much, all the panelists, for your wise words. And for you. And unfortunately, you held back too much. I think we want, to, we want to be a little bit more ruthless next time and get in there and really fight. But thank you so much. You all have so much to offer. But particularly, thank you all attending tonight it's absolutely marvelous um thank you for coming and, and being part of this inaugural dunning africa center webinar series driven by rajneesh and the team in the uk and with us in partnership thank you